How many of you know? That we owe him all the praise. Come on, you can do better than that. We owe him. All the praise. The reason we don't look like what we've been through. Is because of God. Who sits up high, but he rules down low. We owe him all the praise. Amen. I mean, you know, if it had not been for him on your side, you wouldn't be here today. Uh, we owe him all, all the praise, especially on this weekend. When we're just remembering and reminded of the ultimate sacrifice. The song says Jesus paid it all. He's done it all. So the only thing that we, act, we could really give back to him is just our praise. Our gratitude, our thanksgiving, and uh, I just want to thank you uh, just for leading us and ushering us in, in worship uh, this morning, or this afternoon, uh, should I say, um, on this resurrection uh, weekend. Um, if there's any weekend that you ought to feel loved, it ought to be this weekend. Because at its core, uh, the message of the cross is just a simple message um, where God is declaring and letting us all know that he would rather die than live without us. He would rather die than live without you and all your mess and all of our shortcomings. In all of our bad decisions, in all of our bad choices, yet he still chose to die because he would rather give his life than live eternally without you. Is that good news today? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just give it up for your pastor. I see your pastor coming in at this time for the man of God. Pastor George, my good friend who just recently, as I guess many of you should know, just completed his doctoral degree. Amen. Come on, let the church say amen again. Amen. And, and my brother, I'm just thankful that you've just given me this opportunity to just stand uh, before um, your flock here at uh, Breath of Life Fellowship uh, just to share a few words. I know that you guys have been having an awesome time. Um, in your spring fest uh, revival. I know Pastor Kelly and Pastor uh, Seth have both done a wonderful, marvelous uh, job just sharing the gospel truth. Amen. And we're hoping to just continue in that today. I do just want to acknowledge uh, my man Jonathan over here, uh, streaming live, who's here with us. I want to acknowledge as well Randolph uh, from Virginia. Amen. And Tanisha, uh, who I was at Andrews with. And I do want to wish you a happy birthday as well. And then it's just good to just be in God's house on this day. Um, I do want to, um, and particularly in light of the weekend, this resurrection weekend, I do want to just call your attention back to uh, the gospel of John. We are familiar and hear a lot about uh, the seven last words or sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I do want to call our attention to one of those words uh, today, which will be the focal point of this just uh, sermonic time, and that's in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Uh, the young man read it so eloquently earlier. I'm just going to read it again for us. John, chapter 19, and uh, verses 26 and 27. Um, just why don't you go there with me now uh, on your Bibles or your tablets or phones, however you, wherever you have the word, just turn there or go there with me to John, chapter 19, verse 26 and 27. Uh, when you have it, say amen. Amen. Can I just get a little more in my monitor here, just a little more sound in the monitor here so I can hear myself a little better? It's John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27. When you have it, say amen. The word of God says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple 
whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. I want to just read the scripture one more time. When Jesus therefore saw, he did what? He saw his mother, the disciple whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. For the next few moments, let us just consider the message entitled, Behold Thy Son. Behold Thy Son. Bow your heads with me now. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me now. Use me as thy anointed man servant to speak words of life in this your sanctuary. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen. Amen and amen. Behold thy son. Michael Brown. Tamir Rice. Laquan McDonald. Eric Garner. Walter Scott. Sandra Bland. Terrence Crutcher, Freddie Gray, Keith Scott, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Stephon Clark, in the city where I pastored, Tyree King, Henry Green, Antoine Rose. Well, on June 19th, 2018, in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a part of my conference territory, but he was shot three times in the back while fleeing from a vehicle by Officer Michael Rosefield, in whom he posed no threat to, who had just been sworn in as a police officer a couple hours earlier that day. Rosefield was hired by the police department because he had been dismissed as a result of questionable actions from the University of Pittsburgh Police Department. Don't miss that. The University of Pittsburgh saw that he was unfit to serve in that capacity as a police officer. So the city, but they decided that everything was all right. But the sad reality today, brothers and sisters, is that the list could go on and on and on and on and on. Now, let me just say this in the words of Al Sharpton. We're not anti-police. We're anti-police brutality. And I want to make that clear because I want to share with you what Paul Butler a former prosecutor says in the book Chokehold, he says, cops routinely hurt and humiliate black people because that is what they are paid to do. Virtually every objective investigation of a U.S. law enforcement agency finds that the police as policy treat African Americans with contempt. In New York, Baltimore, Ferguson, Los Angeles, Cleveland, San Francisco, Chicago, and many other cities, the U.S. Justice Department and federal courts have stated that the official practices of police departments include violating the rights of African Americans. The police kill, it goes on to say, wound, pepper spray, beat up, defrain, frisk, handcuff, and use dogs against blacks in circumstances in which they do not do the same to white people. So imagine with me today, if you were their mother or father, 
Every one of these black youth, black men, black women's lives, whether it was by gunshot in the back of a police van or in actual police custody at the station, yet their lives were snatched away too soon by the very individuals who have taken the oath to protect and to serve. Imagine being their mother or father and having to bury your child. There may be even someone here today, God forbid, who has had to go through this experience before where you had to bury your son or your daughter. I can't imagine there being a worse pain or greater heartbreak in life because uh, understand it is not natural for a parent to have to bury their child. Children are supposed to bury their parents. And this is why we find heartbreak in our text today as we find Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross of Christ uh, facing the reality that she is about to bury her son uh, as she sees him hanging there, uh, drenched in blood and sweat, struggling to even take a breath. And understand today that this is her son. I know Jesus is the son of God, but yet it was Mary who carried him in her womb for nine months. It was Mary who nursed him on her breast. It was Mary who got up many nights and paced back and forth up and down the hallway, uh, rocking baby Jesus until he fell back to sleep. Uh, it was Mary who kissed his bruises. Uh, it was Mary who comforted him uh, and wiped his tears away uh, as a child and let him know that everything is going to be all right. And to cause even more excruciating pain and agony is the fact that Mary is having to watch her son die knowing there is absolutely nothing she can do about it. And to make matters even more debilitating uh, in this moment is the fact uh, that she remembers the circumstances of his birth uh, and all the, the prophecies that were spoken to her. She understands the importance of his birth. The fact that she was not impregnated by Joseph or any other man, but the Holy Spirit had come upon her. Uh, she remembers the prophecies uh, spoken to her by the angel of the Lord uh, that her son would be blessed and uh, highly favored, that her son uh, is the son of God and uh, he would save his people uh, from their sins, that uh, he would set up a kingdom uh, that would have no end, uh, yet on this day uh, his ending uh, is by death on a cross uh, not the ending she had in mind you see Mary as well as all of the other believers there in that moment did not understand the significance of his death they did not understand the victory they were gaining because of his death. They did not realize that this is how Jesus was going to save them from their sin. Jesus, understanding all of this, in the midst of his dying on the cross for the sins of the world, yet he addresses his mother and his beloved disciple because in that moment when he was most likely weakest and most vulnerable, yet he did not forget about the needs of the individual person. So he says to his mother, woman, Behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. In other words, uh, what he's saying is, Woman, this is your son. Disciple, this is your mother. And from that hour, the word says that he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, home with him. Now, here's the lesson Jesus is teaching us here from the cross. It is the duty of the child or children uh, to take care of their parents in old age. As a child, your parent raises you and takes care of you, uh, but when you come of age and as they get older, it is your responsibility to take care of them. 
Jesus, now dying on the cross, will be unable to fulfill that responsibility himself, uh, so he begins to make arrangements for his mother uh, to be cared for, in essence, uh, while he was handling his heavenly responsibilities. Dying for the sins of the world, reconciling us back to God, uh, yet it did not cause him uh, to forget about his earthly responsibilities uh, or his earthly necessities. What am I trying to say? In other words, uh, he did not allow his uh, heavenly mindedness uh, to cause him to become no earthly good. And, and brothers and sisters, uh, this is the challenge that we face as uh, Seventh-day Adventists today, uh, in particularly in light of the political and social climate uh, that we are living in where the rights of people uh, are being trampled upon seemingly daily. Whether it's health care, immigration, gun violence, mass incarceration, hate crimes, police brutality, voter suppression, wage discrimination, homelessness, inequality, uh, Me Too movement, uh, Time's Up, opioid epidemic, gentrification, redlining, poverty, uh, human trafficking, uh, no matter what the issue is, uh, it's seemingly something daily uh, where the rights of people uh, are being trampled upon from left to right. And you see, as Adventists, we understand our heavenly responsibilities. We strive to live holy. We, we strive to live right. We strive to keep the commandments. Uh, we want to be ready when Jesus comes. Uh, but too often our earthly responsibility uh, to love justly and do mercy, uh, our earthly responsibility uh, of meeting the needs of others, uh, of helping the lost, uh, helping the hurting, uh, standing for right, uh, standing for justice, uh, speaking truth to power uh, are an afterthought. And the reason is because as Seventh-day Adventists, what's greatest about us can at times also be our greatest weakness. What's greatest about us is our message, our prophetic message that Jesus Christ is coming back again uh, and everything about our message is centered around that fact. Brothers and sisters, that is a fact. I believe it with my whole heart that Jesus Christ is coming back again soon. And because he's coming back again, uh, we know that one day uh, all of the troubles of this world are going to be over. What's bad about this is that as a result, uh, oftentimes uh, we turn a blind eye to the social ills and injustices of this world, uh, we don't have time for that uh, because we know uh, it's going to get better one day because Jesus is coming back again uh, as if seeing another unarmed black man or woman, boy or girl, uh, shot and killed by police uh, is okay uh, or not as bad as it is uh, and not worthy of us speaking out against uh, and protesting police brutality uh, because Jesus is coming back again as if seeing little children uh, separated from their parents uh, and locked in cages uh, at our southern border, uh, uh, other children flown across this country uh, and practically given away uh, to new families uh, in which they will never see their parents again uh, is okay, uh, is not that bad uh, because it won't be long, uh, Jesus is coming me back again and what we don't realize 
is that in many ways, we have become complicit in the oppression of our own people. Because as Martin Luther King Jr. says, uh, he who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. Not to mention the fact that the problem with this mindset that we don't need to be involved is that it misrepresents the message and example of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus, while he was there dying on the cross, uh, he knew he was going to raise again uh, in just a few days, uh, but yet that still did not cause him uh, to neglect his earthly responsibility uh, to make sure his mother was cared for. Listen, I know there were Christians in the 1960s who thought Jesus was coming back then. But that didn't stop them from boycotting buses in Montgomery. That didn't stop them from marching from Selma to Montgomery. That didn't stop them from sitting in at lunch counters uh, because they refused to serve black customers. Uh, that didn't stop them from riding the Freedom Rider buses. Uh, and it didn't stop them from fighting for the right to vote. Now, what's interesting about Jesus Choosing to take care of, take, choosing John to take care of his mother is the fact that Jesus was not an only child. But he was the eldest and he had other brothers and sisters who were living, who were supposed to step into that role of taking care of their mother. Yet Jesus chooses John, reminding us that our calling and responsibility to help one another is not limited to a biological connection. But whoever is hurting and in need, uh, whoever is downtrodden, uh, whoever is cast aside, uh, whoever is trampled upon, uh, whoever is broken, uh, we have a moral responsibility uh, to minister to that person uh, and stand with that person. Uh, that is what real ministry is all about. But not only that, but let me just add in a couple more things here. First of all, the fact that Jesus was not so self-consumed in his own circumstance. Remember, he's there dying on the cross. The fact that he was not so self-consumed in his own circumstance, in his own struggle, is why he was able to connect his mother and his beloved disciple together in the first place. The text says, uh, while he was hanging there, uh, dying on the cross, uh, yet uh, he saw his mother uh, and he saw his beloved disciple. Uh, the reason many of us uh, can't help anyone else uh, is because we're so self-consumed uh, that we only see ourselves. Secondly, watch what Jesus says. He doesn't just ask John to take care of his mother or for them to take care of each other, but he initiates a parental child relationship, a mother son relationship. And I believe this is very significant today uh, because uh, how much different uh, would society be, uh, this world be, uh, if we viewed each other, uh, even though we may not be related uh, through DNA, uh, we may not even be the same color, uh, but yet we viewed each other uh, as mother-son, uh, mother-daughter, uh, father-son, uh, father-daughter, uh, brother and sister. How much more would we be willing to 
stand against injustice, fight for rights, stand for rights. Uh, if I view this child, that person, that individual from the community who may or may not visit my church occasionally, uh, yet we view that individual uh, as not just some random person off the street, uh, but this is my son, uh, this is my daughter, uh, this is my mother, uh, this is my father, uh, this is my brother, uh, this is my sister. Listen, this is the example that Jesus has set for us. He was very much in tune with the social climate and social ills uh, of his day and the injustices that people face because of the color of their skin, because uh, of their gender, because uh, of their religion. And he understood that it was his earthly responsibility uh, to address those issues. Uh, as a matter of fact, I truly believe that the gospel and social justice uh, are one and the same. Jesus himself said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me uh, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives uh, and recovery of sight to the blind, uh, to set at liberty, uh, to give freedom uh, to those who are oppressed, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, uh, social justice. You see, when Jesus said that he must go through Samaria and he met a woman at a well, uh, he wasn't just saving her, uh, but he was dealing with racism and misogynistic thinking. Uh, when he dealt with the woman caught in the act of adultery, uh, who all the men who had sexually assaulted her uh, wanted to stone her, uh, but he wasn't just forgiving her, uh, but he was dealing with hashtag me too uh, and times up movement. Uh, when he dealt with the cheating time, tax collector named Zacchaeus, he wasn't just bringing salvation to his house, but he was dealing with tax reform when he stopped by the pool where a man had been lame for 38 years who because of his condition, he couldn't bear the cost, he couldn't pay the price of getting in the pool. He wasn't but Jesus when he healed him. He wasn't just making him whole, but he was dealing with a health care uh, when he addressed Peter uh, about the Gentile Cornelius uh, with a vision about unclean uh, and clean foods uh, and told him that what the Lord has cleaned uh, don't call unclean uh, he wasn't just introducing new friends uh, but he was dealing with a religious ban uh, just like a Muslim ban uh, because even though they were not banned from the country uh, yet at that time they were banned from the church. Jesus, as he saw these issues, his response was not just believe in me. Everything will get better after a while. No, he understood that he had a moral responsibility. Uh, he had an earthly responsibility uh, to deal with it. This is why the word says, uh, be fair-minded and just. Uh, do what is right. Uh, help those who have been robbed. Uh, rescue them from their oppressors. Uh, it says, quit your evil deeds. Uh, do not mistreat foreigners. Uh, that's undocumented folk. Uh, that's immigrants. Uh, it says, do not mistreat orphans uh, and widows. Uh, this is why the word says, open your mouth. Uh, some of us have been quiet for two too long now, but it says open your mouth, uh, judge righteously, uh, and defend the rights uh, of the afflicted and needy. And look, our responsibility to our boys and girls, our sons and daughters, is more than just to make sure they can be pathfinders and adventurers. 
is not enough to just have a Saturday evening outlet in the form of basketball or some other sport, but we have to make sure that they are prepared uh, to face the realities uh, that this is a cruel and unjust world uh, that we live in that is full of hatred and racism. But not only must we prepare them for this reality, uh, but we must at the same time uh, fight against injustice uh, so that we can make this world, uh, this country, uh, this state, uh, this city a better place uh, so that our sons and daughters uh, don't become statistics, uh, that our sons and daughters uh, don't become a news headline, uh, another unarmed black boy or black girl uh, has been killed as a result of police brutality. But not just that, but we don't want them to become a statistic uh, to any kind of violence, uh, gun violence, uh, gang violence, uh, violence in our own communities uh, where our own people uh, are killing uh, and shooting one another. And I'm through, but as Seventh-day Adventists, we must realize, brothers and sisters, that we have a dual responsibility. We have a what? We have a dual responsibility. On one hand, uh, we must both yearn and be ready for the Lord's return. While on the other hand, at the same time, striving to make this world a better place, uh, a safer place for all people, uh, we have a dual responsibility, uh, which is our earthly responsibility. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm thankful uh, that God has given me some earthly responsibilities. Uh, I'm thankful uh, to be in his service. Uh, is there anybody here who's glad to be in his service? Uh, so from this day forward, uh, as we go forth, uh, every boy you see, uh, behold, uh, that's your son. Uh, I don't care if his pants are sagging. Uh, I don't care if his hair is nappy. Uh, I don't care if his teeth are gold. Uh, but that's your son. Uh, as we go forth, every girl you see, uh, behold, that's your daughter. Uh, I don't care if her weave is messed up. Uh, I don't care how many baby daddies she might have. Uh, I don't care if she dropped out of school. Uh, but that's your daughter. Uh, as we go forth, every woman you see, uh, that's that is your elder. Uh, behold, that's your mother. Uh, I don't care if she's uneducated. Uh, I don't care if she used to prostitute herself. Uh, I don't care if she can't do anything for you, uh, but that's your mother. Uh, as we go forth, every man you see, uh, that is your elder. Uh, behold, that's your father. Uh, I don't care if he's strung out on drugs. Uh, I don't care if he's strung out on alcohol. Uh, I I don't care if he's a deadbeat, but that's your father, and behold, that's your brother, and behold, that's your sister. And let's stand together as we fight this battle, as in the words of the late great Bob Marley, get up and stand up. Stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up. Don't forget to fight. Let's stand up for what's right. Stand up for justice. Stand up for equality. Stand up for truth. Stand up for equity. And let's stand against racism. Stand against sexism, stand against white supremacy, stand against discrimination, stand against bigotry, stand against classism, stand against gun violence, stand against police brutality, stand against mass incarceration, stand against children being separated from their families, stand against injustice, and the reason we can stand today is because of a son. Jesus, the Son of God, uh, who became the Son of Man, uh, and because he was willing to lay down, uh, that's why we can stand up. That's why the songwriter says, standing on the promises of Christ my King, uh, through eternal ages let his praises ring, uh, glory in the highest, uh, I will shout and sing, uh, standing on the promises of God. Uh, anybody glad to be standing on the promises of God today? Uh, the songwriter says, my hope is built uh, on nothing less uh, than Jesus' blood uh, and righteousness, uh, I dare not trust. 
us uh, the sweetest frame, uh, but wholly lean uh, on Jesus' name, uh, on Christ, uh, the solid rock I stand, uh, all other ground uh, is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Brothers and sisters, we got work to do. You got work to do. And it is our moral responsibility. That's why we're not having the impact in the world today when it comes to reaching the laws. Because we're too busy trying to prove stuff to people. That the seventh day is the Sabbath. That's all good. 2,300 days. That's all good. But it don't make a difference when that brother is trying to figure out what about today? We're trying to prove that God is real. How about they see God in me by the, how I help them? how I make a difference in their life then we'll make a difference remember what Jesus said we always complain that man we ain't got enough help to make a difference that's not what Jesus said Jesus said the harvest is plentiful a few I said that wrong we always say that no one is interested or wants to receive this word or this message when Jesus said no it's plentiful out there but you got to be willing to do the work are y'all hearing me yeah. and it starts by tangibly making a difference. By saying, I'm committed to this community. And my ministries are geared to reach this community. When issues arise, I'm going to be there. In my city, Columbus, Ohio, where I pastored. Now you heard that I'm the youth director now, but it's still the same city. So when I left my church, I didn't have to go anywhere. I just moved from my church to the conference office. But because of that, because I was so involved in my community, I'm still able to make an impact. So even right now, because of, and I mentioned some of the names, because of issues that we've had in our own city, when it comes to police and police brutality, I was selected to be on, a, on, a, on the Columbus Community Safety Advisory Commission. Only clergy on there that overviews the Columbus Division of Police, their policies, their practices, all of those things. Because I'm committed to making an impact and difference in my city.
when, it, when, marches, when there's a march, I ain't, I ain't looking at it on TV. I'm marching. I, I've been outside of police stations at two, three o'clock in the morning because they're trying to deport Hispanics in the middle of the night. I don't even, I didn't even, I didn't even know the woman. But I know this is not right. Because that's, that's, that's my, that's what I'm, that's my moral responsibility as a professed believer in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus understood the moral responsibility. You see how the people Jesus healed, raised from the dead in the Bible. If his mentality was, we don't need to worry about that, you're going to live in the kingdom one day. Do you think he would have spent time healing people? Raising Lazarus from the dead? Lazarus could have waited till the second coming. Are y'all hearing me? So you all have a responsibility here. And that's how we make a difference. That's how we're going to make real impact. I have, there are people in my city now who don't associate with Christianity. They don't associate with a church. But they look at me as their spiritual guy. They look to me as a pastor to them. Never, never came in my church while I pastored there. But because of the ministry, they saw me committed to making an impact. I can remember first getting in the city, going to meetings and stuff with some of these very people. Don't believe in God, don't think he says whatever. Who now, if we start a meeting, we we'll say, man, are we going to open with prayer? Are we going to do this? Ain't never been in my church, but they seen Jesus in me. I've never given them a Bible study, but I'm walking it. I ain't worried. So we so quick to got to try to get people in. I ain't worried how Jesus going to do it. I'm leaving it up to him. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. And when he's ready to bring them home, when he's ready to seal them, I'm leaving it up to his hand. He knows exactly what he's doing. I'm just trying to be obedient. And if you don't get anything else about what I said today, on this message from the cross, understand Jesus recognized, yeah, I got my heavenly responsibility. Yeah, Evan, we got all of that. But it's, it's not neglect the fact that I have earthly things that I must do and part of that is to show compassion to, to my neighbor my brother my sister, the stranger the foreigner to make an impact in their life and that's how we're going to save the lost while making it better down here Everything ain't going to be solved on this earth. But that don't mean we're not supposed to stand for what's right. Y'all hear me? We'll talk more about this this afternoon. Is that cool? But I just want to make this appeal, brothers and sisters. That on, on the weekend... where Jesus sealed his commitment to us by his death on the cross. Can we make the commitment today that we're going to do the work he's always called us to do? That we're going to make a difference the way he's always called us to do? That we're going to show this world that we care? Don't miss that. That we care. You know how another excuse we make? 
when our churches are, aren't growing or we feel like the people aren't joining the church or whatnot, we say, man, man, this message is too hard. It calls for too much change. How many of y'all heard that before? Nobody had a more controversial message than Jesus. His whole Sermon on the Mount was discrediting everything else that they had been taught before he came on the scene. That's why he said, you have heard it said A, B, and C, but I have come to say X, Y, Z. But yet, what did the Bible say? He always had a crowd following him. Because they felt his compassion. That's what people need today. More than anything else. Compa everything else will work itself out. They need compassion. How many of you believe that? So you're going to just say now, we respond to this field that on this day, we're going to make the commitment. That God, we're going to do the work that we've always supposed to have been doing. And that is making a difference in our community, in the lives of people. Showing this world that we love them. Not because we can give them a track. That's good, that's all fine and well. But because I can make a difference in their life. Which in return will make them more receptible to receive my track, my Bible study. Y'all hear me? But you're gonna say, I wanna be, I'm, I'm gonna be committed here in this church, in this community, under the leadership of this pastor, that you just stand with me now.